Dale mentioned taking away cell phones. I'd like to remind her that the Constitution bars cruel and unusual punishment. <laughs> It's very hard to hear God's voice in our noisy, complex, and confusing world. And yet salvation history really begins with God's voice. The call of Abraham, Abram, in Genesis chapter 12. And God called Abraham. Why did he not call Abraham's father? He was still living. He was the head of the clan or the tribe. And God called Abraham and told him to go to a place. Now Abraham had never had a place. He was a nomad. He took his flocks where the grazing and the water were good. And God called Abraham. Salvation history begins. Matthew's gospel was written to the Jews. In the first 17 verses take great pains to trace Jesus, the Messiah, back to Father Abraham. I dare say James Oglethorpe heard God's voice. In 1733, he founded the colony of Georgia, the last of the 13 original colonies. And one of the principal reasons was to give people who had been thrown into prison because they couldn't pay their debts a place to go and a fresh start. In Oglethorpe's party, there were Scots. Scots who were guided by the theology of John Calvin, which had come to them by way of John Knox. And in 1755, they began a Presbyterian church, the Independent Presbyterian Church in Savannah. <clears throat> I really think that's the only church I've never preached in in Presbyterian Savannah. We lived there for 14 years. The first minister of Independent was a member of the Continental Congress. The first service was held in a stable. And when the first building was dedicated in 1819, President James Monroe attended. One of the very early members of that church was Lowell Mason. I'm sure Laura Lee recognizes that name. Lowell Mason was a composer of hymns. My faith looks up to thee, blessed be the tie that binds, when I survey the wondrous cross, nearer my God to thee. But that was then, and what about now, and what about forever? What is our sense of God's voice? Historians love labels. Middle Ages, Renaissance, Age of Reason, Era of Good Feelings, Progressive Period, Great Depression. And as I said in a previous sermon, perhaps we should call our age the age of worry. If they gave PhDs for worry, my, my father would have been a postdoctoral fellow. The age of worry, huge macro worries, Iran, Korea, terrorism, 
frightening things. And small micro worries. Worries which are unique to each of us and yet common to all of us. I thought when our kids were grown, I wouldn't have to worry about them anymore. I I hear all the older people. (laughs) Yeah, I was wrong about so much. (laughs) But you don't get (laughs) do-overs. All I've done, Dale and I, all we've done is add our grandchildren to the mix. We worry about jobs and money and health. Micro worries which are unique to each of us and yet common to all of us. I thank God Dale has twice fought with and survived cancer. We all share in the common tapestry of life, even though the threads are varied and different. This brings us back to Luke's gospel, commonly referred to as the Sermon on the Mount. Do not be anxious about your life. Instead, seek his kingdom. And Matthew in his gospel adds the words, and his righteousness. Do not be anxious about your life. Instead, seek his kingdom and his righteousness. Think about the people to whom Jesus was speaking. Think about their lives. Terrible illnesses, leprosy of course being perhaps the most frightening. Crop failures, diseases of their flocks, Roman cruelty. I'm sure that they had more to worry about than we do. The Puritans were actually Calvinists who came to this country. We all know the story, getting toward Thanksgiving. Came to this country by way of Holland in 1620. And they worried incessantly over the state of their souls. I've studied their journals and it's Pitiable. They tried so very hard to be reassured that they were numbered among God's elect. Do not be anxious about your life. Instead, seek his kingdom and his righteousness. The eyes of faith see God's hand in the call of Abraham. The eyes of faith see God's hand in the founding of Georgia as a refuge for debtors. The eyes of faith see God's hand in the theology of the reformers, which inspired the Puritans. And the eyes of faith, the eyes of faith see God's hand in the warmth and the caring, the love and the ministry of Good Shepherd. Presbyterian Church, truly a church family. In some circles, it's in vogue to criticize the United States on every occasion. But how much good has been done by this great country, particularly through our Christian churches? Uh, When President George W. Bush spoke on the occasion of the dedication of his library in Dallas, he called the United States a noble country. And despite all the political nastiness, all the sordid things that we see, we are yet a country that is capable of nobility. I think of a picture that hangs in my den. I was laying the cornerstone for a new school in a village in Vietnam called Honai. 
And that school was built entirely with gifts from soldiers in my battalion. Soldiers who loved and cared about those orphans in the middle of a war. This country is yet a noble country. In Psalm 37, David writes, I have been young and now I am old. I have not seen the righteous forsaken. So often in my life I have yearned for and prayed for that which did not come to pass. And so often in my life I have looked back and I have seen God's hand at work in ways I could not have designed. You may have seen this email some time ago written by a street musician in New York. And if you've ever spent time in New York, you know they're quite common. And he writes this. It was a chilly day in Manhattan, but warm inside the Starbucks on 51st and Broadway. For a musician, the most lucrative location in the world. The trip, the tips can be substantial if you play your tunes right. I noticed a lady sitting in one of the lounge chairs across from me, swaying and singing along, mostly pop songs. And after the song was over, she approached me, do you know any hymns? This woman didn't know to whom she was speaking. Before I was born, I was going to church. I gave our guest a knowing look. Name one, I said. Oh, I don't know, she said, you pick one. Okay, how about his eye is on the sparrow? She nodded, put down her purse, straightened her jacket, and after a two-bar set, she began to sing. Why should I be discouraged? Why should the shadows come? Coffee drinkers were transfixed. Even the gurgling noises of the cappuccino machine ceased as the employee stopped to listen. And the song rose to its conclusion. I sing because I'm happy. I sing because I'm free. For his eyes on the sparrow, I know he watches me. When the last note was sung, the applause would have rivaled a sold-out crowd at Carnegie Hall. I embraced my new friend. You, my dear, have made my whole year. That was beautiful. Well, it's funny. It's funny you picked that particular hymn. That was my daughter's favorite song. She was 16 and died last week from brain tumor. She smiled through the tears and squeezed my hands. I'm going to be okay, she said. I've just got to keep trusting the Lord and singing his song. Was it just a coincidence that we happened to be singing in the coffee shop on that particular night? Was it just a coincidence that that wonderful lady walked into that shop? Was it just a coincidence that I chose the hymn that was her daughter's favorite? I refuse to believe that. God has been arranging human encounters from the beginning of time. It's no stretch for me to believe that he could reach into a coffee shop in midtown Manhattan. If we keep trusting him and singing his song, everything is going to be just fine. Amen.